sister. You know, you're going to hear all about her, but let me tell you a little bit of the stuff that she's not going to talk about, which is the accolades and the applaud that she has from so many people, not in Canada only, but around the world. She is a three-time Amnesty International Canada Award winner. She is a member of the Order of Canada. She has more than half a dozen degrees, the latest from the Royal Military College. Uh, and when I introduced her to my partner, Peter, <laughs> he said, yes, ma'am. She automatically felt at home with him. She is a former phys ed teacher. She is a journalist. She is a human rights activist. When I introduced her to my daughter, Mimi, who is here tonight, my niece, Noelle, who are 15 and 14, she immediately struck up a conversation. and. She has that way with her, whether you're in the military, whether you're a journalist, whether you're a woman in need, whether you're a 15 or a 14 year old, Sally listens and she just, if you spend enough time with her, you'll tell her everything. <laughs> but tonight, we get to listen to Sally and I know you'll show her that respect in listening and caring about the stories that she is going to share. Another thing you won't hear is that she's just uh, a new grandma, a grandmother again. She's had, uh, her son has had a couple of twins. Peter is a colleague of mine at CBC and we all just adore him. Um, and really I'm just here because she's his mom. <laughs> and I'm sure he hears that all the time. Oh, are you Sally Armstrong's son? Well, let me tell you, he's a force in his own right. So. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, she, as I mentioned, is an author. This is her fourth book. You will get a chance to pick up a copy and have Sally sign it at the end. I can also tell you that uh, her New York publisher, St. Martin's Press, has just bought the world rights to this book, Ascent of Women. Ladies and gentlemen, Sally Armstrong. This has got to be a little bit odd for you, being on the other side. Sally's usually interviewing, hearing other stories, and tonight, as I mentioned to everyone here, we want to hear your stories. And one of the things that I didn't know was that you taught phys ed. Yeah. And it, it, I think of all the things I could have thought about you doing, and yet here you are leading a charged classroom full of probably uh, overactive teens in phys ed, and then you went into journalism. I want to know how you, and why you made that transition. Well, first of all, I have to say teaching phys ed was I loved it. I just loved it. And what better preparation? Now, as a journalist, I work in zones of conflict. My beat is to find out what happens to women and girls. I spend a lot of time in places that are in trouble. And I'm very often caught in a place where kids are hiding in a basement from rocket-propelled grenades flying around. And I know 300 games. So, you know, <laughs> it's in the best preparation. So how did I get from phys ed? This is a really good story, but I have to, I'll try to make it tight. Um, I was teaching phys ed. I was very, very pregnant with our third child. And a woman I know called me and asked me if I would come down to have tea with her. She had something to discuss with me. She sounded really serious. It's always terrifying to me. And so I packed up my other two little kids, one of whom is sitting here tonight, my daughter Heather, and my son Peter, washed their faces, loaded their toys in the car. And I went to have tea with this woman. She said to me, a man is starting a magazine, and I gave him your name. I said, my name? <laughs> what did you give him my name for? I was always talking in those days as a phys ed teacher about a thing I was doing that I was just loving, and it was exercise to music. It's called aerobics now. <laughs> and the other thing I was talking about, this is the long part of the story, I'll try to make it fast. I was fascinated by something called perceptual motor development. So this is what that's about. If little children don't use the large muscles, the ones required for jumping, rolling, skipping, balancing, then when it's time to use the small muscles, the ones required for cutting, pasting, reading, writing, they won't work as well. Now today we call that a learning disability, but you know, back in the Middle Ages when I was at work, we had other names for it. So a guy did his PhD thesis on this perceptual motor difficulty, and he asked if I would test his theory in my gym, and I did, and I saw it was like magic that I won't go into the details because we really don't have time for that, but it, it helped the children. They moved almost, I think, within four or five months right back to reading and writing where they should be. So I was blabbing a lot about that to my friends. And she said, well, you see, you're always yakking about exercise and 
perception motor, whatever it is. And so I gave the guy your name. Well, I mean, I'm this pregnant, and I decide I'm probably not going to be doing a lot of round off back handsprings over the next few months. <laughs> so I, I'll take the meeting. So I went to the meeting. What do you know? The guy hired me. But he also hired my friend who invited me for tea. Now, she was a home ec teacher, but she gave sewing lessons on the CBC at lunchtime. <laughs> So I thought, she must be a real journalist. She'll tell me how to do this. <laughs> and he hired a third woman who was a recipe developer at Canada Packers. And the three of us opened a magazine called Canadian, Canadian Living. Living. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that a riot? It's a great story. Whenever I lecture at, at journalism schools, I tell that story. I say, doesn't everybody start that way? Mind you, I had a lot to learn. <laughs> I know a guy who was at an airport in Winnipeg. Peter Mansbridge, I think his name mm. is. He's got quite an interesting story as well <laughs> as you. You know, I was sitting on the subway uh, reading your book because I never meet or interview an author if I haven't read their book. I think it would be thoroughly disrespectful. And I've learned that because I did it once. <laughs> <laughs> haven't we all? <laughs> right? I have to come clean on it. And there was a, a woman who... You know, everyone these days looks young to me, but she might have been in her early 20s. And I was sitting there, waiting, getting my glasses out, because now I'm at that stage where I need it. And she said, I read that book. I just finished it. It's a great book. And I had a two-word conversation with her. I said, why? And she said, I had to write this down, because my memory isn't the same as well. She said, it made me want to be better. And then I said, as a journalist, how? Now, we're getting to her stop. And she said, it made me feel strong. Enjoy it. And I'm wondering if that's what you wanted to get out of this book, a, a book that is full of strong women who are kind of like palm trees, you know? They can bend right over in a strong wind, but they will come back up. When you sat down to do this, was that the intention? Was to provide inspiration for those who read it that they can be better and stronger? Well, I'm delighted if that's the the take. But to tell you the truth, um, about three years ago, while I was reporting from the places I work out of, Afghanistan, Congo, Middle East, Somalia, etc., I started to feel like the earth was shifting under the status of women. And at first I thought, maybe it's wishful thinking. I've been telling these stories for 25 years. I haven't had a lot of good news stories to tell. But I did the research and I realized I was right. The earth was shifting, a new age was dawning, and I was so excited about it. And thank goodness, Anne Collins, who's here, where's Anne? My boss of all things, Hi, there Anne. she is. Uh, Anne <clears throat> is my editor and the publisher at Random House. She agreed, but she said to me, you have to, she said, no one's come up with this take before that, that women have turned a corner and that the earth is shifting under the status of women. She said, you have to be able to prove every word in this book. She worked me almost to death. Anyway. I wanted to write the book because as a journalist, I had a new story to tell. I was really excited about it. But Suhanna, the changes for the status of women were happening so fast that even as I was writing the book, they were coming in. I could hardly keep up with them. In fact, the book had already been completed. Anne is such a pro, she can deal with these things. We pulled it back from press because the Malala story happened. And you remember Malala, the 15-year-old girl who was shot by the cowardly, stupid Taliban in the Swat Valley in Pakistan for daring to go to school. And uh, you know what? Two years ago, Malala's story would never have made it into the media. Over there, they would have said, eh, she's a girl. And here, we would have said, well, it's the way they treat their girls. It's not our business. But her story was in almost every newspaper in the world, on every broadcast in the world. And not only that, she stayed in the news. Remember when she had the surgery? Mm -hmm. We all saw the drawings of what they were going to do to her head, cutting out skull bone and putting in cochlear implants and all that. And then uh, about three weeks ago, she went back to school with her little pink backpack over her shoulder. She made <clears throat> the news again. It's as though Malala has become the world's daughter. It's as though a curtain has lifted, and we all said, what the heck were we thinking? And that kind of change is 
all over the world, not that the trouble's going to end tomorrow, but women are asking questions they never dared to ask before. This is the change. This book goes through, and you will have a chance if you haven't already read it, to hear stories of women who were in former Yugoslavia, Croatia, Bosnia, border. The story of Eva really stood, mm. you know, struck uh, hard with me. You will hear about five and 10 and 15 year old girls who are being married at that age to men who are two or three times older than them. You will hear about grandmothers who have lived through it and are now raising their children's children because they have been orphaned due to HIV AIDS. These are stories of women who have lived through things most of us in this room probably wouldn't even dare to have a nightmare of. And to give our audience a sense of the way Sally tells a story without pulling the curtain down on any of the hard truths. I wonder if you could do us perhaps the story of Eva. Well, the, I mean, <clears throat> Eva is one of the, the reasons this story, this book needed to be written. I was in Sarajevo in 1992 doing a story on the effect of war on children. And I was near the end of my story. I had, Sarajevo is a very difficult place to work in, as some of the journalists here tonight know. Uh, I had my story pretty well. I was leaving the next day. You know, in Sarajevo, they used to call it maybe airlines. Maybe you left, maybe you didn't. <laughs> maybe they were shelling the airport. Maybe they weren't. And I was booked on maybe airlines for the next day. So around noon the day before I was to leave, I began to hear stories about women of the so-called enemy being rounded up and put into rape camps where they were being raped by the opposite side. And every journalist knows one of the first casualties of war is the truth. I don't think people lie to you to fool you. I think they, they don't tell the truth because they're so afraid you won't believe how bad things are that they kind of up the ante a little. Well, and I thought, surely that's what this is about, rounding up women and, and putting them in rape camps and gang raping them. This is before Rwanda, before Congo, before Darfur. I could hardly believe it, but as the day went on, I heard it from more and more credible sources. And by the end of the day, I knew this was a story. Now, I was working for a magazine. I could race this headline story to, to press in about three months. <laughs> so I gathered up everything I could, mobile phone numbers and names and anecdotes, everything I could find. And I flew out on maybe airlines the next morning, got to Toronto, and I gave it all to a news agency. And I won't say which one, because I dare say everyone would have had the same reaction. So I gave it to this guy. I said, give this story to one of your reporters. This is unbelievable. Uh, it's a headline. He said, yeah, yeah. So I went home and waited for the headline, and nothing. Seven weeks later, there was a four-line blurb in Newsweek magazine that said, soldiers are rounding up the enemy's women and gang raping them in rape camps. So I phoned the guy. I said, what happened? And he heard my voice. He started giggling nervously. He said, oh, Sally, you know, um, it was a really good story, and I was going to assign it, but, you know, I got busy, and, you know, I was on deadline, and, you know, I forgot. I said 20,000 women were gang raped, some of them 8 years old, some of them 80 years old, and you forgot? Oh, he said, don't be so hard on me. And it wasn't really his fault alone. The fact is, that's how people felt about women's stories. We all heard about soldiers' rape and pillage, and we kind of repeated that, and we all heard about boys will be boys, and nobody did those stories. So I decided then that was going to be my story, and I was going to tell those stories. So I, I, I spoke to my, my, I had a fantastic group of women I worked with at Homemakers Magazine. My gosh, we had fun. And I, we gathered up at an editorial meeting, I told them the story, and they said, well, then we'll do it. I said, it's going to take us three months to get it to the readers. They said, too bad. We'll do it anyway. Two days later, I was back on a plane. And that's when I met Eva. And she told me this extraordinary story. Eva was 46 years old. She was a grandmother of five. And they grabbed her up and they gang raped her. And she told me the story 
it was unbelievable just listening to her story. And I, I found her through a psychiatrist because most of the women didn't want to talk. You know, one of the reasons rapists have managed all these years is because they rely on our shame. And shame has kept the story quiet. And most of these women had terrible shame. They didn't want their families to know. They could be kicked out of their families. They were in such a horrible position. But Eva, maybe it was her age, she said, I want everyone to know. Because until you name the perpetrator and name the event and name what happened to you, she said, we're never going to stop this. So bless her. Today, if that happened, there would be busloads of journalists rushing in to try to get the story because the world has changed, the curtain has lifted, now we know. I mean, you know, it even affects the economy that we ignore this. One thing about being in the media and, and as a journalist yourself, you know that there is a certain time limit for stories and the appetite for those stories. And perhaps, yes, there would be busloads of journalists rushing to cover a story of women being gang raped in a, in a form of uh, abuse, it's so abhorrent. But how long would it last? You say we're at a tipping point where women are affecting change in and amongst their own groups. I want to ask you, I want to get to the media point a little bit later, but how are they doing that if there is that certain timeline of appetite? You see, that's what's changed. The appetite is now the main course. You cannot pick, someone interviewed me recently about a certain agency in Canada and they're looking 10 years down the road and they want to know how to make change for the product they're delivering. And they said, for example, how the heck do we ever convince the media to do a story about women? I thought, where have you been? You can't pick up the paper today that women are not there. We're not page 28 anymore. We're page one. Malala's page one. Look at Jyoti Pandi, the, the girl in India who was raped to death, for God's sakes. Her legacy is she ripped off the lid of 50 years of secrecy mm -hmm. about how women are treated. I mean, ever since independence, there's been this celebration of the fastest growing democracy in the world, but nothing about the treatment of women. Now, the women in India, those brave women are on the street, they're marching, they're demanding change, and this is how you get it. We couldn't get traction on that before, but you asked me, where's a good example of change? I'll tell you a great one, and this is, a major reason I wrote the book. 160 little girls in Kenya between the mm. ages of 3 and 17 are suing their government for failing to protect them from being raped. And interestingly, the case began in Canada because this is the country where the women sued the government for failing to protect them and won. Remember the Jane Doe Jane case? Jane Doe case in Toronto. And, uh, yeah, the balcony remember. rapist. So. The human rights lawyers in Kenya, as well as Malawi and Ghana, I have to say, because they work together, contacted the human rights lawyers in Canada and they said, how the heck did you do that? And the Canadian women said, this is how we did it, and if you want, we'll help you. That, I've been following that for three years. That case went to court on October the 11th, and we were supposed to have, I shouldn't say we, uh, is that a sign you're getting too caught up in your story? <laughs> it, it, they are supposed to, we're supposed to have a decision on April the 30th, but because of the elections in Kenya, remember that there wasn't as much violence as they feared, but there was some, and the courts, the judiciary said, just two days before the 30th, they said, we have to solve all of those cases before we go on with any other cases. So now it's been put off to May the 27th. But everyone I interviewed, from high court judges to the public, said these girls are going to win. And when they win, they will alter the status of women in Kenya, maybe all of Africa. I was speaking to diff different judiciaries around the world because I was trying to get a view on it. And one of them said to me, they'll win all right, and this is going to create a hullabaloo of Shakespearean proportion. I thought, ha. <laughs> when it comes to the rights of women and girls, there's nothing I like better than a hullabaloo of Shakespearean right, proportion. Right, exactly. <laughs> Well, is one of the frustrations that you have in covering some of these stories of women who are affecting change that way, the, the young women in Kenya that you talk about with the Canadian connection, the grandmothers uh, uh, in, uh, I think it was South Africa or in, yes. in Swaziland, having rules and legislation is one thing, enforcing it is another. What about the, the contrast between the cultural law and the law of the land? 
how frustrating was that in telling some of these stories to find that sometimes it was just because that's the way our culture works? You know, you hit the, the nail on the head entirely. This is the story that we need to speak more of. For years, we have tried to interfere, I should say we again, but diplomats and, and even the League of Nations and then the United Nations and all kinds of politicians have tried to interfere when they see the rights of women being trampled in various countries, and in this country too, by the way, from time to time. And, and yet you're pushed back. And when I go there to report on their women, are you kidding? I'm the worst nightmare of the thugs in power. <laughs> they say to me, this is not any of your business. You are not from here. You're not in our religion. You're not in our culture. You have no right to speak of these things. Well, that's a load of baloney. Because what's happening to those women is not cultural. It's criminal. And I have every right to speak about it. And that high time we all did. Because, because being silent about culture that is violent and damaging is ridiculous. This is the change today. And, and we didn't look at it that way before. They always were able to keep us quiet. And, and now these women, as I said earlier, are asking questions they never dared to ask before. They're saying, where is it written in the Quran that my daughter can't go to school? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not written in the Quran. Where is it written I can't go to work? Well, that's not there either. And these women are starting to say, what else did you trick us about? And honestly, I go to these places where I work, and young women are starting to sneer at old men with old customs, <laughs> old ideas. Mm -hmm. I think you better watch out. One of the things you say in the book, and, and you know, I'm sure we've all heard of this, and we've seen the stories of people in need in New York. Somebody falls down on a sidewalk and has a heart attack, and people walk by. Somebody trips onto the subway tracks and whatever. Pick a city with an infrastructure, with an underground. And the CCTV shows nobody jumps down to help them until one Samaritan does it. But you write, people who don't intervene when something is wrong give tacit permission for injustice to continue, proving that there's no such thing as an innocent bystander. How then do we empower those who are not part of your book who are in this audience tonight, who want to read it and be stronger and better, how can they affect change and not be that, um, allow for the, you know, give tacit permission? You know, again, we're, we're all intimidated by the, the, the thought of making change. We all feel the same. I'm not rich enough, I'm not famous enough, I'm not powerful enough, I'm only one person. Who am I to interfere with this kind of thing? You know, what if I got involved and made things worse? My personal favorite is the woman who said, what if I got involved and made a fool of myself? I thought, that's the innocent bystander <laughs> yes, being exactly. an oxymoron. But you know what the most powerful tool any of us have is our voice. I can tell you I've wrecked a few dinner parties in my life. But you know, you know when you sit at a dinner party and people say, oh, they've been at this for centuries, let them kill each other. Or, oh, it's the way they treat their girls, it's none of our business. That would be the time, I think, to use your voice, to say, it's not OK with me. And you plant a seed. You plant a seed that a person thinks twice. Now I believe that seed has already germinated. People have changed the way they think about these things. And it's having such an effect. Look at the story of, um, in Afghanistan, the young women for change. Mm -hmm. Do I have time to tell that or story? Or look at the story of the honor killings, and I'm sure our audience knows about that in Kingston, Ontario, and how people spoke up and said, this is not acceptable yeah. you know, yeah. in this country or anywhere. That's right. But I think, uh, yeah, I think you have time for that story. Well, just to finish on the honor killing, you know, for a time, we, we felt so intimidated by speaking of someone else's culture. But if it's not cultural and it's criminal, why aren't we speaking of it? Mm -hmm. And the honor killing case, the Shafia case in Canada, prior to that, people tended to say it's not our business. It is our business. And Canadians spoke loudly, as they always do when it comes to yeah. justice. And justice was done. The story in Afghanistan, it's another one of the reasons I wrote this book. A group of young women formed an organization called Young Women for Change. It's as provocative as it is modern. You can't believe, only young people can do this, right? Only 19-year-olds can be this wacky with their bravery. They said to me, 
67% of the population of Afghanistan is under the age of 30. I said, we never fought a war. We never started a war. And we hate these old customs that hurt people. And we want change. And we have the tools to make change. They have Facebook, Twitter, blogging. And I said, but the fundamentalists in Afghanistan, if you so much as whisper the word change, they will accuse you of westernizing Afghanistan. You know, when I first started covering that country in 1997, I was, I was very um, aware that I needed to have an answer for that accusation of westernizing Afghanistan. Now I find it about the most tiresome comment on the planet. Mm -hmm. Just because it works, it's not as corrupt, it's efficient, it's western. Anyway, so the, I said to them, what do you say to the fundamentalists when they accuse you of westernizing Afghanistan. And one of the founders, Anita Hatery, 19, said, oh, she said, I say to them, you think girls' education is Western? You think human rights are Western? You think treating people decently is Western? If that's Western, what's Eastern? I thought, oh my God, <laughs> only young people can talk like this. But they are, they are so courageous mm -hmm. and they're determined, determined to turn this place around. And they're turning it around through finding common ground. One of the things that, I, that really also struck me when I read your book was common ground. For example, when I became a new mum, and uh, you, know, you spend your day uh, changing diapers, making baby food because you think, I've got to do this because that's what I'm supposed to do as a new mum, nursing, and at the end of the night when you've got the kids away and you're now washing bottles and putting things away and folding baby blankets, what used to give me comfort was thinking to myself, there are millions of women across this country doing exactly what I'm doing. So there was common ground. I could feel that. I'm not the only one. But what turned my thinking around was reading about women in Afghanistan who couldn't go out without the permission of their husband, couldn't drive, couldn't say, no, I'm not going to have sex with you. Um, they needed the common ground of knowing that for other women, this wasn't the norm. How important is that knowledge that this is not normal, normalized behavior outside of my country or my culture? You know, war brings a lot of ghastly things to a country. It brings destruction, it brings death, it brings fear, but it also brings knowledge. Other people don't live like this. Yep. And in Afghanistan, people began to ask that question. You know, you can imagine when the women in the Canadian military started patrolling the streets, um, men and boys in Afghanistan call girls and women pretty terrible names on the street. I'm an older woman, so I just get stuff like, I get I'm a whore, uh, a, an infidel, and an American spy. Those are my usuals. But to the young girls, <laughs> they say the most disgusting things to them about their breasts. They talk about their vaginas. They talk about the things that they would do to them. Yeah. And, and you, need, you need that common ground. You need others to, to walk with you. And these are the kinds of things these, these girls are doing. And they look at the Canadian women soldiers, and they thought, well, you know what? You don't look like a whore to me. I mean, this is what happened when Facebook started. And, and you know, the, the women's movement, as you and I knew it, was a Western movement. But then with the rise of Islamism in the 1990s, women in Asia started to realize they'd become the targets of extremists. They had to, to organize, and they did, with women living under Muslim laws, fantastic group. Then with the, the spread of HIV AIDS in Africa, African women said to me, we have no right to say no to sex. If we don't organize, we'll all be dead. So they organized. So then you had the Asian women, the African women, the American women, and bingo, Facebook. Uh -huh. And they got online together, and women wearing hijab found out that despite what the fundamentalists had said, women wearing jeans were not all whores. And, and women wearing jeans found out that despite what they'd heard, women wearing hijab we're not lacking in mm -hmm. opinion. And I thought, maybe it was the worst day ever in the lives of misogynist extremists and fundamentalists that those women got together and started <laughs> talking. But that's, that's what's happening now. And then it goes to another level. Because, you know, we've discovered that if you want to make change, you know you can dabble at change. You, you can make a $5 donation to the Red Cross 
and 50 other organizations. Or you can decide you're taking on one organization and you're going to ride that one into the stratosphere. So a group called, uh, and one of their co-chairs is here tonight, Margot Franson, called Women oh, Moving Margo Millions. Here? And these are women who have devoted themselves to making major change. And what they've been able to prove with their work and their research is that that's what it takes. Giving five bucks at a time oh. is nice, but you want to make major change, you have to put big money behind it. And then these women do have the support to get a way out for themselves. You know, you used words like uh, misogynist, uh, extremist, uh, chauvinist. Um, what else did you say? Thugs. Thugs. <laughs> Is it an anti-men book? We've been talking about the incredible stories of women. Is it a book that is anti-men? How would you answer that? You know, it is absolutely, and I'm very glad you brought that up. It, it is not about women over men, or one religion over another, or the East versus the West. This book is about the research that showed that because the status of women is changing, you are able to alter the most intractable files we've ever known. You can reduce poverty. You can stop conflict. You can interfere with violence. And the biggest thing, well, maybe not bigger than that, but you can turn the economy around. Economist Jeffrey Sachs claims that the status of women and the economy are directly related. Where one's flourishing, so is the other. Where one's in the ditch, so is the other. That's what this book is about. You know, I'm always sort of dazzled that someone would think, this is, this is against men. The women in Afghanistan invited the young men to join them in their movement. And I noticed the same thing when I was in Cairo doing the Women of the Arab Spring. The young women there invited the men to join them. And I was dazzled, because we didn't invite the men when, in the 60s and 70s uh -huh. when our movement started. And I said, how does this work? And both Cairo, way more sophisticated, and Afghanistan, probably one of the most primitive countries in the world, both groups said the same thing. They said, we'll never make it to the finish line unless we walk together. It takes young people to be so mm -hmm. wise, doesn't it? Absolutely, it yeah. does. I learn everything about my phone and my iPad and <laughs> my, from my, my talk. I know. We were talking about that. I know, that. you need a 13-year-old. You have a chapter in the book uh, called The Final Frontier, and you write, although much has changed, the final frontier for women is still having control over our own bodies, whether in zones of conflict, in rural villages, on university campuses, or in kitchens. And further on, you write, rape has persisted as a tool of war, a weapon to oppress women and a power play by men. You talk about a, a center here in Africa, this is the Tumani Center, yeah. which means hope. I'm wondering where you find your Tumani in reaching this final frontier. Well, I, th I think there is a lot of hope, but I think it's going to take um, a bigger conversation to get to the final frontier. I, I could raise the issue of that rape in Steubenville, Ohio, as an example of the, the clinging to the boys will be boys attitude. I mean, several news agencies uh, went on air to say that these poor boys, their, their lives are ruined. They had the highest marks. They had the best rep in the neighborhood. They were football stars, and now their lives are ruined. Well, if you want to protect your high marks and your football scholarship and, and your rep in the neighborhood, then don't go around raping unconscious girls and putting the pictures on Facebook. End of story. Mm -hmm. But we still have that hangover of boys will be boys. And that simply has to stop. First of all, we can't afford it. Yep. It, it costs the world too much money to treat half the population like that. Just does. And... You know, the very idea that a young boy, imagine, could, could receive this sort of benediction from CNN for that hideous behavior, I think that's beyond the pale for all of us. Absolutely. I wanna, we're going to get to questions, Sally, and I hope that you've been, I hope that you feel comfortable enough in what is a very intimate conversational setting to ask questions of Sally, 
we've budgeted for about 15 minutes for that to happen. And I just have two more points before we get to that. You ha will likely change your readers through some of the stories that you share here. As I say, Sally, you know, just tells it like it is. I want to know how hearing these stories, how hearing the whispers of a 13 or a 10 year old talk about being raped, um, how there is a fear of being stoned to death for looking at the wrong man who isn't your family, how grandmothers who are raising their children's children on their own with very little food, money, work. How does that change you? How has it changed you? Well, these are very scarring stories. Any journalist in the field will tell you that, and you would know it yourself. Um, I don't think you walk away from those people. They play on the back of your eyelids. You try to find them the next time you're there. But at the end of the day, I am a journalist. It's my job, and I feel very privileged that they'll share their stories with me. You have to trust someone to tell them stories like that. And when you arrive on assignment, as some journalists here also know, who are you? You arrive with your, your high nutrition and your decent clothes and, uh, and your ability to leave. And why should they trust you? So you have to work hard at getting people to trust you. And of course, in that process, I very rarely stay in hotels. I, I, I pay people to let me stay in the mud brick house or whatever, because then I'm on the story 24-7. And everybody needs money, so you know, it works mm -hmm. well. But uh, I think you never forget them. There's, there's a story I used to tell about a young girl in Afghanistan. And um, I can't tell it anymore, because I can't get through it publicly uh, and keeping my own composure. They're scarring stories, but I think they're really important stories. I think those are the stories that can alter the way we do business in the world. Not that they're mine, but letting the world know mm -hmm. that, I think, is a... I want to I leave this on the positive note at which you leave your book. Because while we go through the scars, while we get a chance to see behind your eyelids the stories that, that Sally has seen and heard and shares in Ascent of Woman, uh, Women, she leaves it to a little girl, uh, well, not a little, she was little, she's a teenager from British Columbia, Elena. And the last line is one of hope. Um, she says, we're the generation of change, Elena said. We have the power and a new viewpoint, and we're going to change the world. Watch us. And I took that as inspiring. I took it as this is not a threat. This is a promise. How did, how do you, you wanted to obviously leave the book with this sense of tipping point, change coming forward. Do you put your faith in young women like Elena, young women like you know, my daughter, your grandchildren, my niece, the young women who are in this audience, that they will cherish and nourish women. Look what they're doing. And they're doing it all over the world. It's the little kids going to the water well and saying, I want to go to school. Malala's 15. Imagine, she got shot for going to school. But she insisted, they told her they'd shoot her, and she went anyway. I do put my faith in the young girls. I have to give credit, though, where credit is due. The story of Elena Podmoro. I was giving a speech in Kelowna, BC, um, during the Taliban regime. And uh, at the end of it, there were questions. And I could hear this very small voice, but I couldn't find it. It was a packed amphitheater. And finally, I saw this very tiny little hand waving around. I said, over there, over there, what's the question? And someone, which terrified me, picked her up and put her on the seat. You know those seats in theaters that go like this? I thought, oh my God, she's gonna break her neck. She was nine years old. And she said, with all the indignation a nine-year-old can muster, she said, 
those girls you're talking about are my age. This has to stop. And that evening was being put on by Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan. She went home that night and she started Little Women for Little Women in Afghanistan. And their goal is to raise enough money to pay a teacher so the girls can go back to school. And I can tell you, between Canadian Women for Women and Little Women, uh, these are audited numbers, more than 100,000 little girls are in school in Afghanistan today because of them. But I told that story in a part of the book. And I had a different ending to the book. And my editor, Ann Collins, was on the phone with me one day, and she said, boy, that's quite a story about that Elena Podmore. There's more to the story, but I, well, I'll cut that short tonight. She said, that's quite a story about Elena Podmore. I said, yeah, it is. She said, the uh, book was finished, by the way. She <laughs> said, um, God, if only she was going to Afghanistan. I said, um, actually, she is. And Anne said, so are you. <laughs> so that's the last yes, chapter. Yes, you'll have of to leave book. that because that is the last chapter. With, uh, and, and I think you write that it was a, a moment, that mi a misty moment, or, or some description like that, in watching her meet some of the young women in Afghanistan that this young Canadian woman has helped since she was nine years old. I mean, what an amazing feeling for her. Yeah. Must be an amazing feeling for you knowing that women have trusted you with their stories. I want to thank you, Sally. It's been a great conversation. Thank Sally you. Armstrong, thank ladies you. and gentlemen. Thank you. We're having a question? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It is. It's been an honor for me to sit here. I know I have not asked all of the questions you would have wished I did. So this is where we have some time, and I, I will keep it to, to time. We have about 10, 12 minutes. Yes, ma'am. I'm just wondering what your reaction is to the uh, fallout from the Arab Spring. Nala Ayed on CBC had an interview with uh, the women who are being pushed off the center in Egypt and also Tunisia, and the hope that came through with uh, the Arab Spring now seems to be they got three steps forward and now they're going two or four steps back. They're being pushed back by uh, Islamic governments, the Salafis, and so on. So do you think that they are going to be able to prevail over, A, their conservative base of the society, and B, the upswing of these very uh, rightist fundamentalist movements in these Arab Spring countries? The short answer is yes, I definitely think they will prevail. And the proof I have for that is the time I spent with them after, do you remember the, uh, they overthrew uh, Mubarak uh, in February and then March 8th, International Women's Day, they went back to Tahrir Square and men started attacking the women and raping the women. The reason I say they will prevail is they immediately took action. And I describe all this in the book, and it was something I was pretty surprised I hadn't heard more about. They immediately developed something called harass map. And you can, in Egypt, we can get it too, but in Egypt it's very popular, very easy. And they map where these things happen, and they name, remember the old name and shame campaigns we used to mm -hmm. have here? They're doing that. They name who was there, who did what, and, and on all of these maps they have where to get help. They're fighting back. They're making themselves known. It is difficult, but it always is. What is that theory of revolution, that the, the person who overthrows the king never ultimately leads the people because you're so busy managing the revolution, you don't get to deliver the promises you made to the people, and somebody else comes in behind the other way and delivers on the promises, and that's the person who leads the people. I think a combination of those things are going on. But according to Women Living Under Muslim Law, the women in Egypt are very, very, very active. You know, the same as in Canada in the 60s. You couldn't walk into the House of Commons and say, by the way, we don't like the way things are operating around here. We want some change. You've got to do the research. You've got to write the papers. You've got to gather the people. And remember, it wasn't until 1983 mm -hmm. that we made huge changes in this country. Marital rape was allowed in this country until 1983. And also remember when the, the reform of the judiciary first came up in 1982, which talked about making incest, wife assault, child abuse crimes, 
It was presented in the House of Commons and the members of Parliament laughed in this country. Mm -hmm. And they called to each other across the house, hey, Jack, do you beat Shirley? Ha, ha, ha. Nobody would dare to speak that way in this country now. So there's starting points. And I agree with you, the women in Egypt have a huge job on their hands, but they're working around the clock. And I'm in touch with those women. And I, I'm pretty sure they will prevail, but it'll be hard. Yes, ma'am. We can, I can repeat your question if nobody can hear you. I might have to ask you to go to a microphone because I can't remember everything you've said. <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> I'm honest with you. Really <laughs> saying, I guess, uh, that um, you know, you're viewing things through a feminist perspective, and um, I, I'm not denying in the least, you know, the validity of that. But I'm, I'm thinking that perhaps it's a bigger issue that we need to be talking about, and that's tribalism, and that's the embedded nature. There is like anti, you know, you say it's not the East versus the West, but it is, it is you know, in the Middle East, and uh, the, you know, the so-called Arab Spring elections every four years, like human rights is not every four years. Human rights needs to be, um, uh, you know, we have to be vigilant about human rights every day, and we're talking about views that, um, you know, that are not just anti-women, but uh, you know, anti-Christian, anti-gay, anti-Semitic, anti-West, Western values, and I just wonder how you respond to that. Well, um, with respect, I don't agree that anything's bigger than a gender issue. Um, if the tribe sees men and women as equal, I think you deliver an awful blow to tribal law. Tribal law is mostly directed against women. Um, I think in any protest movement, if the people involved in the protest are considered to be equal, you will have a much better result. Uh, I think every piece of research that has been done has shown Isabel Coleman from the Foreign Relations Committee claims if your country oppresses women, you are doomed to be a failed state. All of these studies, and they're, they're coming at you so fast right now, they are all showing that if you, you improve the status of women, you will alter all the other things you just mentioned. And, and, and maybe you're right and I'm wrong, but in my 25 years of watching this story develop, I think that the research is absolutely right on. Look what happens with women. Uh, remember it was um, Mohammed Yunus, um, the man who started the Grameen Bank. He, he's a Bangladeshi man and he, he received the Nobel Prize because he felt that if you loaned money to women, they would alter the status of the family. And, uh, and if you loaned money to men, you would alter the status of the man. Um, we know it's true, we know it's true. And I don't mean it as an insult, it's just a fact. So I think the gender issue is the biggest one. And we never looked at it that way before. We used to think you had to solve other issues, any, anything other than women. It, it's gender, I think. We'll agree to disagree. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. All the politics the conversation. Are, are huge. And yeah, thank you. Can I? Uh, sure. Would you like to join us at the microphone? Okay. I have an opinion, but it's not a studied opinion. I didn't cover it as a journalist. I haven't done research on it. So I know what you know reading in the paper. And so I don't think I'm qualified to uh, give an opinion on that. Hi. First and Hi. foremost, thank you for a wonderful conversation. Um, in terms of uh, women's rights and so forth, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about uh, Assassa Shakur being on the FBI's uh, about most the, what? the Assassa Shakur. 
uh, being on the FBI's most wanted list as the first woman ever to make the list. I'm not familiar with uh, enough with the story. Does anybody know? <laughs> you do? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> One person knows. Um, oh, that's in the news today. Yes, yeah. yeah. It was in the news last week um, as well. She was an activist um, in the civil rights movement. She was exiled. Ah, okay. Yes. It was, and, what okay. country? It's the, it's the U.S. The U.S. Yeah. Uh, she was exiled to Cuba and on the third right. year. And her two um, colleagues are dead? Yes, yes. So on the 30th anniversary, they've increased the bounty on her head to $2 million. And also, she's the first woman to make the, the most wanted FBI list, although she's been uh, acquitted of most of her crimes and so forth, alleged and so forth. And you want my opinion on that? <laughs> I'm all for first women, you know. First woman <laughs> governor general, first woman prime minister. I like those first. Her case, not so much. <laughs> I think we'll leave it. Leave it. Okay. At that. Well, I guess you need more it. information. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you I for a great it's... conversation, and uh, hope to speak to you afterwards. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for a great conversation. Your questions, ladies and gentlemen, Sally Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs>